Well, folks, you know what time of year this is. We're getting closer and closer to WrestleMania with each passing day. With that in mind, here on the channel, we're going to review a couple of classic WrestleManias on the classic segment. This week, it's WrestleMania 4 from March 27, 1988 at the Trump Plaza, though technically Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It is a time of great kayfabe uncertainty in the World Wrestling Federation after one of the biggest world title controversies in company history. The belt was held up in February, and now we have a one night. 14 man tournament to crown a new undisputed champion. Talking about the set for just a second, not too much to speak of in terms of any kind of theme, but one of my favorite parts of this, I think a very enduring visual uh, for WrestleManias 4 and 5, where they both happened in Trump Plaza, was the long golden staircase and the gold ramp leading to the ring. Uh, not too many Mania sets having stairs like that, so it's different. The color uh, pops out to me. It's very like retro, almost kind of homey in a way, the golden color they used. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's one of my favorite parts of this look and what really makes it stand out from the other manias. Just under 20,000 people showed up for the event, a 6.5 pay-per-view buy rate. Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura are on commentary here. Bob Uecker shows up back for the second year in a row. He makes a joke on commentary at his own expense about, hey, I got picked up for the second year. That's never happened to me before because that was his career in baseball. He hopped from team to team. And then like he gets under Jesse Ventura's skin. They have a war of words all night. Jesse is like, uh, well, you never stuck around with one team for very long, Euchre. Great comeback, Jess. A very cinematic shot of Mean Gene as he's welcoming the fans. You see this panoramic shot a lot in entrances throughout the night. Gladys Knight sings America the Beautiful, and it's time for the Invitational Battle Royal. Basically, anyone who's not part of the tournament or a championship match. There's a big trophy. If there's one thing Vincent Mann loves to this day, it's giant trophies. Breaking down the participants here, the Hart Foundation, the Young Stallions, Sika, Dangerous Danny Davis, The Killer Bees, Bad News Brown, Sam Houston, The Rougeau Brothers, Ken Patera, Ron Bass, The Junkyard Dog, The Bolsheviks, Hillbilly Jim, King Harley Race, and George the Animal Steel. Sam Houston with a big bump to the outside. It's the first elimination and the camera almost misses it entirely. George Steele just kind of hangs out on the outside of this match. He never actually gets in or sets foot in the ring, but he does metal. He does pull Jim Neidhart out and it counts and everything. And eventually he just leaves. Like George never gets eliminated by anyone. The referee just yells at him and points in the direction of the ramp like, go away, George, go home. And he eventually does. And he just never gets involved in the match ever again. So so it was nice to see him there, I guess. Jacques taking out one of the killer bees, but also his brother Raymond, which is never really examined or noticed or talked about. The bees are gone, as Euchre says. Nice callback of action between Junkyard Dog and Harley Race in the previous year's WrestleMania. Volkov takes his one bump of the year, and he and Boris Zukov take Patera with him. The final four are Paul Roma, who's soon taken out, JYD, Bad News Brown, and Bret Hart. Uh, JYD hitting headbutts on anything that moves. Brett and Bad News double team the Junkyard yard dog and they're talking strategy. They finally eliminate JYD. They celebrate in the ring and Gorilla's like, well, maybe they're going to share the prize winnings or something. Ghetto blaster to heart out of nowhere. Brett takes his patented sternum bump into the corner. Brown throws him out and wins. Brett comes back in and kicks Brown out and destroys the trophy in the process. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. I've said before that battle royals are typically harder to rate at the same scale as like a regular match because there's all these different bodies and everything. And really, uh, the way these battle royals are structured, the real story begins when the numbers whittle down. So once you have the final three with Brown and JYD and Bret Hart, things get really interesting. And the story they tell there I thought was very good. But also just the action you had in, in the battle royal itself was entertaining as well and uh, but yeah the ending part with Brett and Bad News the iconic moment where, uh, where Bad News hits the enziguri the ghetto blaster to Bret Hart that really helps elevate the rating for this match. Euchre leaves his post on commentary in the opening match goes looking for Vanna White get used to seeing that storyline play out for a very long time over several segments across this show. And boy, it gets more entertaining every time, folks. Speaking of celebrities, Robin Leach from the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous show, he reads an opening proclamation because he's got a fancy British voice. Whereas, 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 yes, we get it, Robin. Like I said, the focus of this year's WrestleMania was the one-night tournament to crown a new world champion. So how do we get to this point? Why was the championship held up for the first time in its entire history? To answer that, we go to January, where this point, the Million Dollar Man 
and Ted DiBiase is on a roll. He has made his intentions known. He wants to buy the world championship from Hulk Hogan. Hogan refuses. He will accept no money, no bribes to, uh, to uh, relinquish the championship to DiBiase. Enter Andre the Giant, Hogan's old rival from the previous year, WrestleMania 3. Well, by this point, uh, Andre's contract has been bought out by DiBiase. So now essentially Andre is doing the bidding of DiBiase. And he's made it known from the beginning, not only will he beat Hogan for the World World Federation Championship at the main event, he's going to then hand it off to DiBiase. So the plan is already there. They've made their intentions known. The match happens at the main event in February. And uh, infamously, it ends when there's crooked officiating. That's not Dave Hebner, the referee. That's some other guy that DiBiase paid to get plastic surgery to look like Dave Hebner. In actuality, that's actually Earl Hebner making his television debut. That's the original championship screw job in the Federation, folks. So anyway, Andre wins the championship under these screwy circumstances. He hands the belt to DiBiase, which technically makes him the champion, but then President Jack Tunney declares that because the belt was not, it was, did not change hands in a sanctioned match, then the title change is nullified. So Andre as champion is still part of the record books. He is a champion for, you know, however many minutes he's technically held it, but DiBiase's reign does not count. It's not in the record books, despite the fact he would, he would work a few different shows uh, in certain markets while wearing the championship. He was photographed with it, videotaped with it, billed as the champion, but that's all basically it's a phantom reign, doesn't really count, and so now the title's been held up, and it'll be declared in this 14-man tournament. This storyline is, if not the most important, it's certainly one of the most important angles in Federation history. It, it really accomplished so much. It really helped establish some more lore into the championship and like how the belt is represented. It really cemented DiBiase as the top heel in the company, and also helped uh, pave the way for the future winner of this tournament. Not going to spoil it for you guys as a main eventer, a real credible main eventer. Also, it introduces the world to Earl Hebner, who would have a history of screwing people in championship matches, and just really did something different with the championship. The idea of someone wanting to buy the championship, it had been done in other companies in the past, but not on the, on the scale and the level of the WWF. So that was a first for them as well. So yeah, a lot was accomplished here, and I think it was very well executed, very well accomplished, and like everyone still talks about it to this day, it's a very important storyline in the company, and it was, I think, done to perfection. So with that context out of the way, now it's finally time to talk about the tournament itself. The first match we see is Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, who's accompanied by his cronies, Andre the Giant and Virgil. Duggan looks good early on, but DiBiase puts the boot up to cut him off. A hideous looking sunset flip by Hacksaw, but he landed it. Andre with the trip up. DiBiase hits a knee to the back at the same time Andre decks him. In full view of the referee, by the way, and DiBiase pins to win. Duggan is mad and chases them off. I'm going to give this one two stars out of five. Honestly, a lot of these tournament matches will not be rated very high because a lot of them are really short and don't have time to breathe and develop into a quality match. That being said, uh, the physicality here is good. The chemistry these guys have. The Duggan and DiBiase, their history in Mid-South, I think it really plays well into this match here because they know each other so well. The story of Andre being involved in DiBiase's business to help him further along the tournament also plays into this as well. But yeah, the match is just, you know, one of the many matches you'll see that are very short tonight. For the young lady, your favorite, a pina colada in the coconut with a twist of liquor, a spurt of lemon, your favorite mango mix, whipped cream with a cherry on top. Shaken, not stirred. Backstage, Gene Okerlund interviews Brutus the Barber Beefcake. I swear Okerlund looks right at Beefcake's crotch and goes, what a package. Brutus is very intense in this promo. He's got a fine steel blade honed to the sharpest edge for Jimmy Hart. Snip, snip, snip. Continuing on with the tournament in the first round, you have Dino Bravo, who's accompanied by Frenchie Martin, taking on Don Morocco with superstar Billy Graham. Morocco is not only the magnificent one, he's also called The Rock. It's always weird to hear, you know, older era nicknames being recycled and then being used more famously, like Gorilla Monsoon used to call Bob Orton the excellence of execution. Then they got transferred over to Bret Hart and that stuck with him. And the, Don Morocco was The Rock. And then The Rock, Dwayne Johnson eventually uses it and then it becomes a megastar. For a couple of big guys, they move fast early in this matchup. Morocco with a really weird drop out of the corner. Bravo blocks one of the arm drags and goes on the offensive. Morocco fights back and attacks the leg in a spinning toehold. And oh shit, a hangman spot by Morocco. Those are always shocking to see. 
Bravo uses Morocco's pile driver, but he poses too much and he can't put the rock away. Morocco with a big comeback, but the referee is caught in the crossfire and is down. Bravo with the side suplex. Referee calls for the bell. Bravo thinks he's won, but Morocco actually is won by disqualification for being pulled into danger. I'm going to also give this one two stars out of five. Uh, the opening sequence really threw me off guard and like surprised me in a good way. The finish with the, D the, D the delayed DQ was a bit disappointing, but besides that, everything else in the match was solid. Bob Euchre backstage still looking for Vanna White when he's interrupted by the Honky Tonk Man and Jimmy Hart. Euchre tries to crack wise with the greatest Intercontinental Champion of all time and the Colonel, but they're having none of it, and Honky says he'll hit Beefcake with a shake, rattle, and roll and retain the championship. Keeping with the first round of the tournament, you have Greg Valentine with Jimmy Hart, who can teleport apparently, versus Ricky the Dragon Steamboat with Little Richie. I swear the, the dub themes you hear with some of these wrestlers, like Steamboat, like Morocco, and so forth, uh, it's that, that alone is pretty jarring, but also you've got this like crowd noise they have underneath that's on a loop, and you can hear this one like shriek over and over again with those themes, and it, it's like nails on a chalkboard, drives me up the wall. <laughs> Steamboat begins very strong. Many nice arm drags, but Greg soon takes over. Their, their offense for both guys is very chop heavy. Ricky with a big karate chop across the throat on the outside. Ricky and Greg are in a knife edge chop off. Hammer with a top rope brain chop. Ricky looks to be in a bad way here. Figure four attempt is blocked by Steamboat. Makes a big comeback. The flying brain chop of his own. Ricky with another flying move. Top rope cross body. But Valentine rolls through and grabs the tights to pull a fast one. Wins and advances to the next round. I give it three stars out of five. It is the best match in the tournament so far. It's going to be one of the better ones of the night, honestly. But this one is a good physicality. The sneaky finish at the end was very nice as well. So yeah, I uh, can't complain about this one. Backstage, Mean G interviews the British Bulldogs and Coco Beware with their respective animal mascots. Speaking of which, Matilda's back. Uh, the English Bulldog was dognapped by the Heenan family some time ago, but she's back in the hands of Davy Boy and Dynamite. And she's been doing some special weasel hunting training. She's going weasel hunting. Speaking of which, weasel hunting, side note, sounds like the name of a lovely Nordic town. First round tournament action as the natural Butch Reed with Slick takes on the Macho Man Randy Savage with Miss Elizabeth. Don't get used to the outfits that Macho and Liz are wearing here. They will change their outfits literally every match they're involved in tonight. Reed using his strength advantage to work over Savage early on. Big diving fists drop off the second rope. Savage makes a brief comeback, but Reed snuffs it out. Goes to the top, is distracted by Miss Elizabeth, but Savage Beals him off, diving elbow drop, and Savage wins. I give this one one and a half stars out of five. It's probably one of the shorter first round matches in the tournament, and really there's not much to it. It's like Savage takes a couple of minutes of offense and then just quickly makes a comeback, and that's it. Not much back and forth or ebbs and flows at all in this thing. Obviously, they want to try and protect Savage for later in the night because you'll be, be seeing him a lot, but um, yeah, this one, not much to it. Bob Euchre backstage yet again, still talking about Vanna White and everything. I feel the format for these first two interviews is seeing doing backstage. It's like, hi, I'm Bob Euchre, Vanna White's with me, and now I'm going to just kind of riff for 30 uninterrupted seconds and just kind of freestyle me and Vanna hanging out until someone, please, someone, God, cut me off and interrupt me. That's what we see here as well with Bobby Heenan and the Islanders. Uh, and then uh, Euchre asks Heenan if he's scared of Matilda. No, absolutely not. Back to the tourney we go as the one-man gang with Slick takes on Bam Bam Bigelow with Sir Oliver Humperdink. Gang with the early attack throwing Bigelow around, which is no easy feat because they're both very large guys. Monsoon with the classic irresistible force immovable object line, but it doesn't have quite the same gravitas as it did with Hogan and Andre last year. Bam Bam signals for a big move. He goes to hit the ropes, but Slick pulls down the top one, and so Bam Bam just like tumbles to the outside. How does the ref not see what's happening here? He's in clear view. Maybe because he's too busy screaming everything at uh, the wrestlers here. It's the first time I noticed this guy. All he does is scream commands. He's doing the count. Four! Five, six, he's like, he's right in your face. You don't have to scream it to him, he's right there. And so Bam Bam's on the apron, the referee is still counting. Despite seeing all the interference Slick is doing, referee counts Bam Bam out and the one man gang wins. Holy shit, what a weird finish. I will not be able to unsee that referee the entirety of the night. I give us one a half star out of five. It is, you know, the, the, the Savage Slick match, or the Savage Reed match, wasn't that great, but it's a lot better than this one. It was just, oh, the finish to me was so clunky and ugly. And again, it just really just 
completely kills the illusion of any authority the referee has when the screaming referee can't see the interference directly two feet from his face. Hulk Hogan backstage cutting a promo on Andre the Giant and really like the first portion of this promo is very irrelevant. It's kind of forgettable because the story, the real meat of this promo folks, the thing everyone remembers for is the, is the part where he describes, you know, slamming Andre to the ground, the fault lines open and people and buildings are falling and then you got Donald Trump hanging by one hand on the Trump Tower, his family in his other arm. You know what? Instead of me just describing that to you, I'm going to let Joe Graham from the How To Wrestling Podcast read that portion of the promo to you in her very posh promo voice. So take it away, Joe. If you look in their eyes, man, have you seen the fear in all those little hulksters? They realize that when I get Andre the Giant cinched up in the launch position, when I slam him through the Trump Plaza brother from New York down to Tampa, Florida, the fault line is going to break off. And as Andre the Giant falls into the ocean, as my next two opponents fall to the ocean floor and I pin them, so will Donald Trump and all the Hulkamaniacs. But as Donald Trump hangs on to the top of Trump Plaza, with his family under his other arm, as they sink to the bottom of the sea, thank God Donald Trump's a Hulkamaniac. He'll know enough to let go of his materialistic possessions, hang on to the wife and kids, dog paddle with all his life, all the way to safety. But Donald, if something happens, if you run out of gas and all those little hulkamaniacs, just hang on to the largest back in the world and I'll dog paddle us, backstroke all of us to safety. In your final match of the first round of the tournament, you've got Jacob the Snake of Roberts versus Ravishing Rick Rude, accompanied by Bobby Heenan. Should be a good one here. During the entrances, Jesse reminds everyone that Rude won the Jesse the Body Award at last year's Slammies. By the way, my 87 Slammies review is uh, in the archives. Check it here in the upper right-hand corner of your screen with the eye card there. In the match itself, Roberts is too smart for Rude in the early going. Rude's terrified of the snake. I like the tenacity of Jake's wrist lock here early on. It's a simple move but done really effectively. We got a cool crisscross spot here and then from this point on it's all about Rude and his chin lock. I think at least 40% of the matchup here is Rude getting Jake in this chin lock and really finding ways to work it and Jake fighting out of it but ultimately going back into the chin lock. Uh, he on the outside is great too because at one point he's telling Rude not to waste time and then at one point he's got the chin lock locked in and he just goes ring the bell like the match is already over. But yeah he's working the chin lock forever. He gets a boring chant and and somehow it got so boring that it eventually worked its way up to being exciting again. Because the final time that Roberts finally breaks out of the chin lock and makes his big comeback, by that point the crowd's really into it. We got some, it was, it's so weird, this inverted bell curve where the crowd just dies for a while, gets restless, and they're like, holy shit, he's coming back. Like that's amazing storytelling. It's a great way to bring the fans back into it. Rude drops Jake with a high suplex, goes for a dirty pin in the corner, but the bell rings before the three count. Turns out the time limit draw, which means that one man gang gets a buy. I give it three and a half stars out of five. I don't think this match was boring per se, like some of the people in the audience did that night, but I will say they really worked that chin lock almost to a detriment. And it's, it's a credit to their abilities for being able to have that crowd getting restless and then have them right back in the palm of their hands by the end of it. And like how many people do you know who can work a chin lock for as many minutes as they had that thing locked in? All the different ways they had Jake trying to fight out of it and getting brought back into it. Finally, a big crescendo at the end, and the crowd eats it up. That is the mark of some great workers in Rudin Roberts, which is ironic the fact that neither of them advanced the tournament. Mean Gene stands in front of a sweet-ass tournament board. Welcome his guest from Wheel of Fortune, Vanna White, as he describes the most famous letter turner in the entire world. Hey, Vanna, how's Bob Euchre? Who? Vanna then also gives her two cents regarding some of the picks for the next round, and she talks about Savage and Elizabeth saying she likes Miss Elizabeth. It's good for Savage to have a woman person behind him. Her words, not mine. 
in a battle to see who truly is the biggest beefy boy of them all. You have Hercules, accompanied by Bobby Heenan, taking on the ultimate warrior, rocking a rare headband. Kind of a cool look for the warrior here. Like I said, it's a, it's a grudge match. It's another big boy fight here. These guys are just like laying into each other with closed lines. It takes three closed lines for Hercules to take down Warrior. It takes one for Warrior to take down Hercules. Warrior picks Hercules up and just puts him down. More staggering around. There's a 10 punch in the corner. Herc hits a reverse atomic drop. Hercules with the full Nelson applied, but Warrior is able to post off of the turnbuckle and lands on top of Herc while the hold's still locked in. Gets his shoulder up just for the three count, so Warrior wins this one. That's got to be the most technical thing I've ever seen the Warrior actually do in the ring. After the match, Hercules jumps. Warrior tries to choke him with his chain, but Warrior fights out of it and swings the chain around to scare Hercules off. I give it a half star out of five. It's an ugly match. You know, same rating as the Bam Bam Bigelow one-man gang match, but it's a different kind of ugly. If I'm going to borrow a phrase I used in my last classic review, uh, it's two big water heaters trying to dance. That's the best way to describe this match, honestly. Warrior would take the momentum from winning this match at WrestleMania, go on to SummerSlam later that year, and squash Honky Tonk Man in about 30 seconds to win the Intercontinental Championship. They show a big video package that recaps the story thus far from the main event of WrestleMania 3 right up until when the championship was vacated. Time for the rematch of the century to open up the second round of the tournament as Hulk Hogan takes on Andre the Giant. As former champions, these two were granted a first round bye, but they have to face each other in this round here. Hogan storms the ring, but Andre's on the quick attack. Hulk fights back, getting a noggin knocker with Andre and DiBiase, who's on ringside, by the way. Andre falls back as he's caught in the ropes. The shirt's off. What an opening sequence here. Andre taking repeated blows until he finally slowly takes a knee and falls down. Hogan with some elbows, but Andre chokes him on the mat. You can just see how hard it is for Andre to get around this point, just to get down, to get up, to do much of anything. This is a man in pain there. Andre chokes Hogan into a trap hold. Hogan fights out of it with some punches and an avalanche in the corner. Virgil on the apron. DiBiase enters with a chair. It has no effect on Hogan. Hulk and Andre fight over the chair. Hogan hits Andre Andre, naughty boy Hogan, the referee says. Then Andre dinks Hogan on the top of his head with the chair. Okay, now the ref says it's gone too far, and now he disqualifies them both. One more shot with the chair, and Andre goes down. Hogan then chases DiBiase up the ramp. He goes to suplex Virgil on the ramp, then just drops him. Like, I'm not taking that bump, brother. Like, poor Virgil. He gets beat up so much in these reviews. Hogan runs back into the ring, slams Andre for good measure. So neither man advance, very similar to the Rude and Roberts ending, where neither guy advances. But at least Hogan gets to pose, and pose, and pose. I give it two stars out of five. Anytime I see a double DQ in anywhere, I always laugh because it's usually done to the point where that's kind of a bullshit finish. Like, hey, Hogan clearly hit Andre first with the chair. He should be disqualified, full stop. Even if Andre didn't go down from the chair shot, like, it's still being hit with a weapon, basically. But, oh, when Andre does it, oh, we can't have anyone hit Hulk, so I'll just throw the whole thing out. That being said, I think the match was well done for what it was. Obviously not the same kind of level of mystique or drama or magic as WrestleMania three. And also a very different finish, but still entertaining nonetheless. And uh, Andre, for as limited as he was with his mobility and getting around, still was able to tell a good story with Hogan here. A promo by Randy Savage where he declares nothing will stop him from getting to the top and winning that championship. On we go to the next match in the tournament as Don Morocco with Billy Graham takes on Ted DiBiase. Ted does not want to get in at first, but Morocco forces him in. No protection now for Ted. Don's got the early advantage here. Morocco does like a fun like game you would like do with a toddler where he's grabbing Ted by the ankles and like picking him up, putting him down, picking him up, but putting him down. But DiBiase is able to use his leg strength to pull Morocco into the corner and knock him out. The scream ref. Oh my god, I didn't realize the screaming ref. He's back here, and he's still screaming. DiBiase working Morocco over with some fist drops. He goes for a trust fall elbow, but he misses. Morocco makes his comeback. DiBiase drops a running Morocco into the top rope, throat first, and beats him. Wow, that is not a finish today, but still very effective. I give it two and a half stars out of five. Another pretty short match in the tournament, but I think the story was good and the action was on point. Fun match to watch. And now, by virtue of these double draws and double DQs and everything, everything. DiBiase has a bye going to the next round, so he goes right to the finals. Old sad sack Bob Euchre is still backstage. Did somebody kidnap Vanna White? Where is she? Demolitions show up. They are covered in glitter. Smash talks about their opponents, strike force, and says they're basically going to hit their opponents in the head with baseball bats, is essentially what he said. It's bigger than big! Euchre looks at Mr. Fuji and says, I'm not eating sushi.
douchey anymore. Thanks for sharing. The one man gang and Slick celebrate the unopposed quarterfinal matchup. Gang will face the winner of this next match as Greg Valentine with Jimmy Hart takes on Randy Savage with Miss Elizabeth. Macho Man starts off fast, but a cheap shot by Valentine allows him to get his stuff in. A top rope punch, an elbow drop, and so forth. He throws Savage out of the ring and does more damage on the outside on the apron. Savage wakes up, makes a rapid fire comeback. As he dives from the top rope, though, Greg hits Savage on the way down. Valentine looks to have things in control, goes to the figure four, but then Savage catches him in a small package and wins. I give it three stars out of five. Another one of the more entertaining tournament matches on the night. I feel that as we get further in the tournament and the, the match quality will hopefully get a little bit better here. The physicality in this match was great. It all looked so good. I think these two have a really good chemistry and it works really well together as Savage is a relatively freshly turned face and Valentine, of course, is still, you know, very much a heel. These guys work really well together um, in this particular matchup. A short break from the tournament action now as Honky Tonk Man defends the Intercontinental Championship against Brutus the Barber Beefcake. Honky is accompanied by the Colonel Jimmy Hart and Peggy Sue, who I just learned from doing research for this show that Peggy Sue was Sherry Martell in disguise. Uh, Queen Sherry, Sensational Sherry, whatever you want to call her, that she was doing double duty here. She was the women's champion at this time. So, tells you a lot about the state of the women's division in the Federation when your champion has to put on a wig to play a different character. Can you imagine like Becky Lynch or Bailey or Rhea Ripley put on a wig and, try, and trying to pass them off as like a different character? Now, to Sherry's credit, had I not looked up who actually was playing her, I don't think I would have guessed because I think that Sherry really got into the character. Like the sunglasses and the wig really obscures a lot of her face and also like she just gets into the dancing and the she's a totally different character from her usual Sherry self. So she really went into it and so that could have fooled me. I was very impressed by that. As the match begins, Jesse Ventura says on commentary, Brutus looks like he survived the Three Mile Island nuclear problem. This is a big pantomime match here. It's like it's so over the top and so shtick as the match begins. Brutus catches Honky's foot and they hop around forever. Big atomic drop and a big sell the bum. Oh, he's messing up the hair too. Follows up with a ramming the head of the turnbuckle, the high knee. Beefcake is fast, but Honky dodges an elbow drop and takes advantage, working him over for several minutes. Jimmy Hart even gets a shot in. Goes to the shake, rattle, and roll, but he stops. Does it again, close to the ropes this time so Brutus can block it. Brutus keeps doing like the finger scissors taunt, gets the sleeper locked in. Jimmy Hart's back on the apron. He decks the referee with the megaphone, which actually legitimately knocks Jimmy Corderas out. Brutus thinks he won, does a silly dance before realizing what happened to the ref. Brutus now wants to cut Jimmy Hart's hair. He grabs him under the ring, starts snipping. Hey baby, don't cut my mullet, ha 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 ha. Everyone's trying to wake Honky and the referee up. Honky and the Colonel and Peggy Sue escape while Brutus wins by disqualification. Bleh. I give it one star out of five. The match is kind of like junk food. All these empty calories of all the big silly faces. Like honestly, like 90% of this match was everyone doing a face. And then there was like not much substance to it besides that. And the ending was super lame. Like, you gotta protect Brutus Beefcake. You, got, you can't have him lose clean to the honky tonk man. God forbid. Ha ha ha! It's outlandish! Zicky Dice! And you're looking at your future wrestling with regret. Champion outlandish. Bob Euchre and Andre the Giant in their now legendary encounter backstage. Andre gloats and basically admits to Hogan that the whole thing was a scheme to keep Hogan out of the tournament. That's why that match went down the way it did. Euchre famously asks Andre to get his foot off his shoulder and why you little? Six man tag match up next as Bobby the Brain Heenan in a very rare entering performance teams up with the Islanders, that's Haku and Tama, aka Tonga Kid, against Coco Beware and the British Bulldogs. Back in late December, Bobby Heenan stole the British Bulldogs dog. They kidnapped poor Matilda, Davy Boy and Dynamite's mascot, and they finally get Matilda back and everything, and so now the revenge is on the minds of the Bulldogs. Heenan's now wearing one of those like big, puffy, like tough like suits that attack dog trainers wear, like bite resistant, but to Heenan's credit, still puts the hell over out of Matilda, because when Matilda runs toward him, he just bolts out of the ring. As the match begins, Davy Boy showing his big power early on against the Islanders. Coco tags in, he's a house of fire. Vince 
Ventura with some very interesting commentary in regards to Heenan's appearance. Heenan looks like a Chinaman, don't he? He sure does. <laughs> Heenan finally tags in and is all stomps, takes one shot and tags Tama back in. At one point in commentary, Monsoon's talking to Ventura, talking about the dog napping. Can you imagine, do you know how many millions and millions of kids love Matilda? All the hundreds and thousands of letters that they wrote in support of her and everything. Like, like millions and millions of kids. Like, look, I know the Federation was a big deal in the mid-80s, but I, I would find it hard to believe that millions and millions, meaning two million and above children, really cared that much about Matilda the dog. Anyway, Heenan's back in, but Coco attacks him. All six guys are in the ring now. The Islanders grab Coco and slam him. Then they launch Heenan, and he drops on top of Coco. Pinfall and the heels win. Ooh, so dastardly, but the Bulldogs at the last laugh on the ramp. Matilda on Heenan! Matilda on Heenan! Stone Cold Matilda! Stone Cold Matilda! Two stars out of five for this one. It's basically a comedy match. The whole crux of this matchup is Bobby Heenan versus a dog. Not much to that, but they are able to expand on that with the work that they do in the ring. The wrestlers themselves do a great job. The heels win in pretty sneaky stuff. Jesse Ventura gets to pose for some reason as we go on to our next tournament match, the only match in the third round due to that bye, as Randy Savage takes on the one-man gang. Ugh, this fucking referee. The crowd is very tired by this point, very quiet as this thing goes on. Gang throwing his weight around early on, but Randy's able to keep picking out. OMG goes for a splash, but Macho moves, starts making his big comeback. Gang is caught in the ropes and gets blasted out of the ring, and the bomb's away. Slick gets right in Elizabeth's face, almost decks her. The referee is distracted by Liz. He's so quiet here, I'm surprised he's not going, What are you doing up there? Get down! One man gang starts beating up Randy with Slick's cane, but the referee catches it. Savage wins by DQ, though he is beaten down and goes to the finals. Savage knocks Gang and Slick down in the ring, and he heads to the back. This one gets two stars out of five, but folks, by this point, I ask you not to take these star ratings from matches too seriously. It's just basically how I felt about this matchup. It wasn't. It was good to see the fire from Savage and a good story leading into him making his way to the finals, kind of falling backwards into it by DQ. But uh, you know, the match itself self wasn't that great and really like as far as these ratings go for the tournament matches especially just consider like a margin of error of like a half star. Mean Gene is sad that Vanna White's leaving him and so is Bob Euchre. He's been getting letters from a guy named Vance White which of course naturally leads to confusion between Vance White and Vanna White whose name he's been saying about 8,000 times over the course of this show. Easy to do. Our next match is the Tag Team Championships as Strike Force defending against Demolition with Mr. Fuji. Girls in Cars man, that's the theme for Strike Force you love to see it. Speed versus strength here. Strike Force with a smaller team, obviously, so they open things up with a lot of fast double team moves. Big double team in the corner on Tito, though, when Fuji's got the referee distracted. Axe and Smash take turns, putting a beating on Santana. Tito busts out the flying form out of nowhere, gets the hot tag, and Martel is going wild in demolition. Rick Martel trying his best, but you know the fans are just asleep by this point, sadly. Martel with a Boston Crab on Smash. Fuji on the apron. He gets beaten up by Tito. The cane enters the field of play. Axe takes out Martel. The ref's taken down as well. We get a slow three count and new tag team champions. Demolition, baby. I give this one two stars out of five. It's a very basic tag team match formula, but it's executed well enough. But it's just one of the many, many screwy finishes we see all throughout the night, and so that takes it down a peg. This would, however, be the beginning of Demolition's record-setting reign as tag team champions. They would go on to hold it until July of the following year, and the record would finally be broken just a few years ago by the New Day on Raw. It's time for the main event, the tournament finals. Who will become the undisputed world heavyweight champion? We're going to find out as Randy Savage takes on Ted DiBiase. And what a couple of stories these guys have had going into the finals. Because DiBiase's had it easy. He's only wrestled twice. He's had a lot of help and a lot of good luck to allow him to wrestle only two times this tournament. Meanwhile, Randy Savage has wrestled three times already. This is his fourth match. He suffered a lot of pain and hardship, including that beatdown with a cane from the previous match with one man. And gang. Robin Leach brings the championship down the ramp on a big red pillow. Pretty bold to have the fans able to just reach out and touch it on the way down, though. Bob Euchre is the guest ring announcer. A random fan hugs him before he's taken away. I wonder if it's the same guy who hugged Roddy Piper the previous year. And Vanna White is the guest timekeeper. As the match begins, Andre the Giant twice grabs Savage's leg and the referee misses it. Hogan chants getting louder and louder. DiBiase working over Savage with some blows, but Randy gets some of his own licks in. Savage with the trademark offense 
Lance goes for bombs away, or he wants to at least, but Andre standing over Teddy Biasi, blocking his path. What a what an image there. Savage confers with Liz, and she runs off to the back. Out comes Hulk Hogan to help even the odds in the Macho Man's corner. The mega powers help each other out here. Both men are trading blows. Andre tries to drag Savage out, but Hogan stops him. DiBiase goes to the top as Savage beals him off. Elbow drop on the top is missed. Million Dollar Dream locked in by DiBiase. With the referee distracted, Hulk hits DiBiase with the chair. Wow, what a baby face. Savage with a flying elbow and wins. Becomes world champion for the first time in his career. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. I'm kind of torn about this one because on the one hand, it tells a great story of Savage's big fight through all these obstacles to finally reach the top of the mountain and win the championship. On the other hand, this match really plays into the often held belief that Savage spent most of his career in the shadow of Hulk Hogan. And this is a perfect example of Hogan's appearance burying the lead of Savage, you know, being winning the championship. I mean, God, like celebrating at the end, like he's the focal point, hitting DiBiase with a chair, which allows Savage to do the final move to win. That's what heels do. That's not what baby faces do. Your top two baby faces in the company doing that. That's absolutely crazy to me. That's what turned the tide was Hogan have to be involved, hitting the chair and everything. My God. However, Savage would hold this belt for a very long time. He hold for an entire year, right up until WrestleMania 5, when the Mega Powers done did explode. And here's the funny thing. According to legend, this outcome wasn't even supposed to happen. According to what a lot of people say, Ted DiBiase was supposed to win the tournament and become the champion. But in a weird butterfly effect kind of thing, Honky Tonk Man did not want to drop the Intercontinental Championship to Randy Savage. Like he refused to do it, and for some reason the company couldn't force him to do it. So that made them to change the audible and say, well, we have to have one babyface champion. That's why they put Randy Savage to win the tournament. So DiBiase, I can imagine, was probably sold a bill of goods. I know he was told like when he was brought in as a million dollar man, you're going to be the champion. That was the end goal the entire time and it never comes to fruition and this was the best time to do it and it just doesn't happen. So that's got to be sticking in, in Ted DiBiase's craw. On the other hand, like the big consolation prize was the debut of the million dollar championship. He's mad he can't buy the World Wrestling Federation championship so he buys and creates his own championship and I would argue that having a belt made for you and that is part of your legacy as a wrestler and it's one of the most like recognizable championships in all pro wrestling, to have that associated with you, to me, is a lot bigger for your career and your legacy than winning the WWF championship uh, once or however many times. I think the million dollar belt, more important to DiBiase than winning the world title would have. I don't know if you're aware of this, but 16 matches is a lot of matches, especially when so many of them have so many wonky finishes, like a time limit draws, double disqualifications, a screaming referee countout, interference. This show had that stuff in spades. So many wonky finishes, which really bring down the energy and the satisfaction level of a show like this. That being said, Randy Savage's story arc is terrific. It is like the best part of this whole show to see him finally win the big one, but it took a long time to get there, a really long journey. Most of the matches aren't very good because they're so short, and then there's other matches that are just pure stinkers, like the matches with all the big dudes, the muscle dudes and everything. Uh, this is not a great show. In terms of overall match quality, this is one of the bottom tier WrestleManias. In terms of an overall cohesive story, I'd say it's probably in the top 10, honestly, because of the story that Randy Savage and Teddy Biasi have. Those stories are great, but the match quality in this show is not so good. So I think it just kind of puts it, it ends up putting it in the middle of the pack, in my opinion. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of WrestleMania 4. Or if you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. And the next time, the next WrestleMania I'm going to cover... Oh, God, I just want to get out of the way. Um, WrestleMania 27, y'all. Woo!